702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. One of my favorite times when listening to Reedy Tlabi is a Friday morning run about this time when Chris Smith joins us to answer all of your science questions. A very good morning, Chris. I suppose we have already wished you a happy new year, but it's a happy new year from me. It's not Chinese Happy New Year yet either, so we can still <laughs> legitimately say that for a month, Africa. Good morning, and uh, it's good to be back. It is good to have you back. Now, I know we're going to talk about colds being more common in the cold, but I already have a number of questions waiting for you. So shall we go to Jen in Bryanston first? Hello, Jen. Hi, Africa. Hi, Dr. Chris. I would hi, like Jen. to know... How, uh, hi. I would like to know why can't cell phones have long-lasting quartz batteries like watches? It's called applications, mm. Jen. <laughs> Yes, the the thing that's revolutionised the mobile communications market, if you like, over the last decade or so, has been the battery technology. If you look back at old pictures of people on the first generations of mobile phones about 20 years ago, then you'll have seen that they were carrying around something almost resembling a brick. And most of that was the batteries. And that's because in order to achieve decent quality of communications, you need a reasonably powerful uh, transmitter and receiver. And also, most phones are endowed with pretty powerful screens on them now that draw quite a high current. The batteries we had originally, the early generations of batteries, just couldn't cope. And it's been a step change in battery technology, and especially lithium cell technology, that's made it possible to have the devices that we do have today. Now, that still has constraints, and so we've still got some way to go, and that's why phones don't last as long as we would like them to last. And part of the biggest draw is also the screen and running a very energy-intensive processor. But that said, scientists are coming up with better and better computer chips all the time, which use less and less energy and waste less and less energy, and better and better screen designs, which are less and less energy hungry. So a convergence of better batteries in future with advances in technology mean that you will have longer-lasting cell phone functions. But it's a long journey and it's a tough nut to crack because the demands being placed on the technology are so high. Interesting question, Jen. Thank you very much for it. Uh, Malcolm is in uh, Sydney. Hello, uh, Malcolm. Hi, good morning, and morning, Chris. Chris, I I read recently, I think last week, that um, they've discovered a new class of antibiotics and that um, they believe it's going to be the answer to some of the resistant strains that are around using um, what they said was a cell technique, and I didn't quite understand that. Um, Do you know much more about it? Hello, Malcolm. I spoke to the gentleman who did this this week. His name's Kim Lewis. He's a researcher at Northeastern University in America. And what he has published in the journal Nature this week is the discovery of not one but 25 potential new antibiotic molecules. Their lead compound is one called Tyxobactin. And the way they did this and their rationale was to say the antibiotics that we have today, which we use successfully, are antibiotics largely made from organisms that live in the soil and they're made by getting those organisms, culturing them in a laboratory, and extracting from them chemicals, in other words antibiotics, that they make to fight off other competing microorganisms. We can take those compounds and use them. But the problem is only a tiny percentage, perhaps 1% of the microorganisms that live in the soil, are capable of being grown in the laboratory. They're so fastidious in their needs that you can't make a Petri dish uh, become a substitute soil environment to make them grow. And what Kim Lewis has announced this week is a very clever trick to make them grow and therefore access a whole repertoire of chemicals that these bugs we couldn't grow before know how to make and therefore potentially turn them into drugs. The trick that they've developed is that they get some soil samples, they sandwich filtered samples of the soil, which have got just tiny numbers of these microorganisms in them, uh, and they put them between two sheets of a membrane which has tiny pores in it, and these pores are big enough to allow molecules from the soil to go in and out, but too, too small to allow bacteria to go through. And their rationale is that the microbes that won't grow in the laboratory won't grow because they need other growth factors, which we don't know what they are yet, but they're in the soil um, because we don't know what they are. If we put this whole 
device back into the soil for a while, the microorganisms will get a kickstart, they'll start to grow, and then we can transplant them into the laboratory. That's exactly what they did, and the first lead compound they, they got out of that was this tuxabactin um, compound, which kills things like MRSA, the hospital superbug, very effectively. It appears to be very safe, and they were able to take mice that had what would otherwise be a lethal infection with MRSA, the staphylococcus superbug, and Instead of 90% of the animals dying, they all survived when they were given the chemical and the mice remained healthy afterwards. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Malcolm. Interesting question indeed. Was seen in Benoni. I, I didn't even know about the question that you're going to be asked, uh, asking Wasin, and I live in Cape Town. What's your question for Chris? Hi. Um, I just wanted to know, there's a place in Somerset West. Um, it's on Parallel Valley Road. What happens is, if you look at the road, it's, you can see it is a downhill. But when you're driving your car down, so it's a short downhill at a specific area. If you're driving your car, you put it into second, from second you push it into neutral, your car actually stops on the downhill and starts going up, back. Basically, your car is reversing up the downhill. Now, it's just a specific area that does that. And the faster you go down, the faster your car will go up in the opposite direction, even though it's a downhill. Wasin, I'm, I'm presuming that you have experienced this yourself, correct? I've tested it twice last week. Oh, my word. All right. Well, someone told me about it, and I went out to then check it. And uh, we, we checked it out twice. I went the one day and the next again and went and did the same thing. And apparently, if you're walking or running down the road, you'll struggle as if it's an uphill, and when you're coming up, you'll find it a bit easier. It sort of defies gravity for that specific area. I guess we'll be going after the show. Chris, do you know why this is happening? <laughs> Yes, there are a number of uh, examples of this in various places around the world and the reason it happens is because of an optical illusion. The way that your brain works out which direction things are in and whether or not you're going uphill, downhill and so on is that it uses perspective. If you imagine that you're standing on a set of railway tracks and, you're, and they're straight and they're long and they go off into the distance, you've probably noticed that it looks to your eye like the railway tracks come together in the distance, like they're a very distant V shape with the apex of the V pointing away from you. And this is, again, a, a, an optical illusion. It's because the distance between the two tracks relative to everything else in the distance shrinks to become a single point as far as your eye is concerned because of the way the eye works. And the brain also is then looking at the size of those tracks relative to each other compared with everything else in the visual scene and concluding that they're very, very small, therefore they must be very close together. And what happens when the car goes the wrong way up a hill is that there is very, usually various roadside scenery or embankment, an embankment or certain buildings which slope in a certain direction, fooling your brain into thinking the road is sloping one way when in fact it's sloping the other. And it's a sort of similar situation to, you must have seen this thing where you can create a very special room which... Uh, a person looks very small at one end of the room, but like a giant at the other end of the room. And this is because the room actually is sloping away from you uh, and becoming much smaller. But because it's doing it in a consistent way with everything being the same size relative to everything else, you, your brain doesn't notice that, in fact, the room has changed size. So when a person walks from one end of the room to the other, they go from being a, a, minute, a midget to, a, to a, a giant at the other end. And it's the same sort of phenomenon uh, on that road, which is why the car looks like it's going the wrong way up a hill. In fact, the hill uh, does work the right way and the car isn't braking and violating the laws of physics. What's in? Okay. okay. <laughs> I, I find it, I find it, I'm still a bit confused because it, it's just a 50 metre stretch and like I said, it really looks like it's a downhill. And, you know, well, Sim, can you send us some I, I, pictures? Can you can you take some pictures and um, and send them to us on our Twitter feed? If you I tweet some pictures, pictures to pictures, Naked Scientist. I tweet to Africa the, the actual point. I can, I can tweet it to him on, on the, from Google Maps. I'll tweet it to him, the actual point, because I've got it saved on my phone. And I will go Brilliant. Let's send everyone it. down there in their cars. There will then be a massive <laughs> traffic jam and no one's car will go anywhere. <laughs> Wasim, thank you very much for your question. Most interesting indeed. David is in Claremont. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chris. What I want to know, is there a cure for tinnitus? Hello, David. Uh, it, tinnitus 
is a ringing in the ears sensation yeah. and it becomes more common as we get older. It's also associated with certain drugs. There are some antibiotics that can damage the inner ear. There are some drugs like aspirin, which can also cause a ringing in the ear. But by far and away, the commonest cause is mm. exposure to loud sounds over a lifetime. Mm. And the reason it happens, we believe, is because the cochlea, which is your inner ear, which has tiny cells in it called hair cells that convert sound vibrations in the air into brain waves, sound waves into brain waves effectively, those different hair cells respond to sounds of different frequencies. And if you're exposed in a long-term sustained way to sounds of a certain frequency, the hair cells that decode those sounds break down and are eventually lost. And this leaves a gap in the hearing spectrum in your ear. The brain is tuned into the cochlea and is listening for sounds along that spectrum. And when it doesn't hear anything, one theory of tinnitus is that the brain says, well, I can't hear anything. So in the same way that if you were struggling to hear the radio on at home, you would turn up the volume, the brain turns up the volume of the signal coming from the ear. And in the same way that all radio stations put out a little tiny bit of hiss, the hiss as the brain turns up the volume goes up and therefore your perception that there's a hissing noise there goes up and the noise corresponds to the bit of the cochlea that is now missing where those hair cells have gone the frequencies that you're no longer able to hear properly and the brain then tunes into those frequencies because the way in which our brain decodes sounds is that we pay special attention to certain parts of the audio spectrum uh -huh. in order to for instance if you're in a noisy environment and someone is talking to you despite the barrage of sound coming to you from the noisy environment you can still focus in and home in on what the person is saying to you when this mechanism is employed in the, in the context of tinnitus, it makes your brain focus on the tinnitus, and that makes the tinnitus become even more intrusive and even more annoying. And so people say at the moment there's nothing we can do physically about it, there's nothing we can do potentially chemically about it, apart from if it is caused by a drug, treat that and, and stop taking that drug or change medication. Um, but in the case of naturally occurring tinnitus, people say the best treatment is to learn to ignore it because then this tuning in mechanism goes away and it doesn't sound quite so annoying okay thank you Thank you very much, uh, David. In Claremont, a number of SMSs responding to the call we took from was seen in Benoni a moment ago, uh, Chris. Tim saying the Somerset West Road is a very well-known optical illusion, uh, and Tim is a Somerset West resident. And that place is called Ghost Hill, apparently, suggests another SMS. I'm certainly going to visit that Ghost Hill soon. Uh, Peter is in Pretoria. What's your question for Chris, Peter? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Africa, it's Peter Lopeng, a boxing correspondent, but luckily I'm not asking about the... Um Boxing. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm up, asking about a question on apartments. Chris, what I want to know is, uh, you know, these days, guys, uh, my, my car is one of them. When you drive, it shows you the consumption, your, your fuel consumption as you, as, as you drive. But what I've noticed that now, if I put my car in neutral and I'm moving uh, faster, the consumption seems to be going uh, down rather than when the uh, the um, the car is, is going slower. And for me, it does not make sense because uh, the distance between point A and point B is the same. Uh, it doesn't really matter how quickly I cover it, slowly or, 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 or faster, the consumption has to stay the same. Or am I really missing the point here? Yeah, this is a good observation. And what's being referred to is that in modern cars, you usually have a miles per gallon or miles per litre or kilometres per gallon, depends on where you live and if you're metric or imperial. But it's basically working out how much fuel is being burned for the distance being travelled. If the engine, though, is in neutral and at tickover, then it's only burning fuel at the tickover rate, which is about 0.1 litres per hour for a reasonable diesel engine. When your car's going along, the computer in the uh, dashboard says, ah, the car is going along and it's in gear, therefore I'm burning fuel to make the car move, so I'll take the tick over fuel consumption, whatever that is, and divide it by the speed to work out what the distance travelled per unit consumption is. And because you're only at tick over and you're coasting along at a very high speed because you've got your foot off the accelerator, if you've taken your foot off the accelerator, the, fl the flow of fuel actually to the engine is only at the tick over rate, but the car still thinks it's achieving that rate of and, and distance of travel with that amount of fuel going through. So it says, ah, oh, well, I must be travelling at... And usually it turns into such a stupendously high uh, number of miles per gallon or, or um, kilometres per gallon 
in, in the calculation that it truncates it to 99 um, because it can't do more than two digits. So you'll see it goes to 99, which basically means it's, it's gone up beyond a certain threshold. But that's why it's, it's a foible of the way that it does the calculation. But in fact, it's not impossibly wrong. It's not wrong because when you, when you take your foot off the accelerator, you're not using any more fuel. Um, the engine is only allowing a certain amount of fuel per um, revolution to go into the engine, and that's the tick-over rate level of fuel consumption. Mm. Okay, so the car is lying to me. <laughs> not really. Um, it, it, it's, it's not lying to you because your, your level of fuel consumption when you take your foot off the accelerator drops to the rate at which um, the engine would, you, would um, supply for tick-over mm. um, because the, the throttle is closed. But the engine obviously is trying to go faster than that, but the car is going along, and so it works out that it must therefore be covering that, that amount of distance with that amount of fuel. So it's not lying, but it's not purely accurate because, of course, you had to spend that fuel to accelerate yourself up to um, a, a higher speed to start with. Careful, Very Chris. Uh, P- Peter may think that you're a politician and not giving a straight answer there, but Peter, uh, thank you very much for your question. Margaret is in Bryanston. Good morning. Morning, Chris. My grandson, Michael, wanted to know, please, why do leaves on trees and plants end in a point? Good question. Well, this um, tip, the, the, the leaf tip, is probably a drip tip. And uh, plants and, and uh, trees and things that have big uh, collections of leaves if you take a big tree there's probably a sixth to a fifth of an acre's worth of leaves up there maybe 200,000 leaves on a very big tree and the mass of all those leaves probably adds about a ton to the mass of the tree during uh, its leafing period now those leaves present a very big surface area and if you cover them in a film of water which is sticky water's pretty heavy and the amount of water that could land on the tree during a big rainstorm and then stick to the surface of the leaves would be in the order of at least doubling the mass of the leaves. And this would apply even more load to the tree, which could do harm. The other thing that that film of water could do is to change the environment on the surface of the leaf. It would make it a better environment for moulds and fungi to grow on, so the leaf could get damaged and attacked by those microorganisms. It would also be a barrier to the movement into the leaf of gases like carbon dioxide, potentially from the air, and also light to drive the process of photosynthesis, so it could uh, hamper growth. So by tapering the leaf to some kind of tip, it makes the water naturally flow to that tip and then drip off, because water is a sticky molecule, and this keeps the leaf surface dry and clean, and it means, therefore, there are fewer barriers to diffusion so that the leaf can can uh, help the tree to grow and for light to get in for photosynthesis. Super, lovely answer. Thank you. Thanks Thank very you very much. much, Margaret. Carl is in uh, Randval. Hello, Carl. <coughs> Good morning. How are you doing? Very well. Thank you very much. What's your question for Chris this morning? My question is, what is the physiological importance of smiling or laughter? Why do we do that naturally? Makes you feel good. That's why. Chris? <laughs> We're all smiling now at that question, aren't we? And that's because it's one of those universal forms of communication. I don't think it matters which country, which culture, which colour, which age you are, and even if you're a nearly newborn baby, smiling comes naturally. And it's our way of visually expressing an emotion. It's saying to another person, hey, I'm friendly, I'm in a good mood, I'm receptive to your approach. Uh, On the other hand, if you looked angry and you were red in the face and and you looked like you were going to thump somebody, that would be a visual way of saying approaching me right now would be probably a bad idea and the reason we've evolved to use these signals is because we are visual creatures we've got very good vision very good color vision and more than a third of our brains is devoted to decoding what comes in through our eyes so not surprisingly because we devote so much brain power to visual communication and we place so much emphasis on it we use it to tell each other how we're feeling and another good example of this is looking sad and crying crying serves no purpose biochemically really um, but it nonetheless tells other people about our emotions. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Enver is in Fairways. Good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. Hi. I'd like to ask the prof a, a question, please. I'm Vertigo. Uh, a prof, uh, uh, um, Vertigo, what is the cause of it, actually, and, and is there, is there a, a cure for it? Well, vertigo is, if you look in a textbook, the definition is uh, the sensation of rotation in the absence of movement. 
And there's a number of reasons why a person would feel that the room was spinning when in fact nothing was happening. The most common one that most people have experienced is because they have been to the pub and they've imbibed a bit too much sauce. And what we think is happening there is that the alcohol which you drink gets into your bloodstream, goes up to your head and dissolves in the fluid which is in your middle ear, inner ear, yeah, middle ear, sorry, got confused there, in the fluid in your middle ear, which is how the head senses movement. And because it changes the density of that fluid, it means that the uh, brain decodes the signals from the movement of the fluid incorrectly, and it thinks that there must be a lot more movement going on than there really is. But people who experience vertigo don't just experience it when they've been and had a few drinks too many. It can also correspond to damage to the nervous supply to the ear, so if something goes wrong with your balance system, then the brain gets confusing and conflicting signals, and this can make people feel vertiginous, like everything is uh, for swimming around uh, in their head. Um, and there are also other reasons, including some drug side effects can do this as well, and certain other stimuli. If people go to a very high building, and the perspective of looking over the side and seeing everything so far away, it can cause a rush of adrenaline and make people feel very panicky and nervous and that can produce a swimmy verti- uh, vertigo-type sensation as well. Oh, I see. No, it's just that, that you know, uh, my, my mom is suffering from this, and she's, and she's, uh, she's elderly, uh, and, and she's been having this, but it's not, it it's used to be on and off, and now she's getting it more often. You know, I and, wonder um, if um, this... You see, there are a number of um, conditions uh, which... Are of, which affect the um, system in the inner ear because your inner ear does your, um, although it's called the inner ear, actually it's, it's your balance system. I said middle ear earlier, it was wrong. Um, in your inner ear, that's where your balance system and hearing system is and there's a number of things which uh, can affect that. One of them is a condition called Meniere's disease which is where the fluid levels in there go wrong and this can produce horrible sensations of movement and it can make your eyes move when you don't want them to uh, because the fluid system isn't mo- working properly and this can uh, affect your a whole sensation of movement and in the same way that your hearing system becomes less acute as you get older the balance system uses exactly the same system and therefore it's possible that that uh, is happening there's also occasional occasionally you get sludge or kind of bits and pieces of, of material build up in those canals inside your head that detect movement and that can produce all kinds of horrible sensations and there's something called an Epley's maneuver that a doctor can do to dislodge some of this sludge and make it fall out of the parts of the ear that detect movement and that can make some people feel much better so it might be worth going to see the GP and saying can I have an Epley's maneuver please and see if it makes things better. And good luck with that Enver thank you very much for your call. Uh, Chris we don't have time to talk about colds being more common in the cold can I ask Reedy to have that discussion with you next Friday? You can do, or you can take a look at the Naked Scientist website because I've done a little write-up at nakedscientist.com. Uh, if you look on, on the news section, you'll see I've done a little write-up of why colds really are more common in the, uh, well, cold. I will look out for it. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful week. Thanks, Africa.